Almighty God, thank you for one another. Thank you that you've not only saved us through our Saviour, but given us brothers and sisters to work with, and you've filled our life with purpose and meaning. And hard as it, as it often is, uh, we are thrilled to have this privilege of working with you and for you uh, in the gospel. And we thank you for one another here. Thank you for the range of backgrounds and ministries and churches. And although that's sometimes difficult as we find it hard to communicate and cooperate, uh, we thank you for one another. Thank you for the different experiences and gifts and wisdom you bring. And we pray for our time now that as we talk and discuss, ask questions and ponder answers, uh, we pray that the whole thing would be done in a, an atmosphere of willing cooperation, willing to learn from one another, uh, willing together to bring the gospel to our communities, our nation, our continent, and beyond. And so please make this a very useful time. In your purposes, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> um, so Richard, one of the things you've referred to just casually through the day is just, the, I guess, the number of people here who you met in London. You had a hand in, in training them. I'm, I'm one of those guys. Um, and certainly when I was in London and from what I've heard of things at Dundonald even now, there seems to be a strong ethos of raising up new gospel workers and um, a solid apprenticeship program. And um, yeah, just that ethos of identifying people who might have the gifts for full-time Christian ministry, testing those gifts, sharpening those gifts, and then releasing them into full-time ministry. And perhaps just your thoughts on, I'm sure you've made a lot of mistakes, but what are the things that you think have... <laughs> yeah, yeah, no defense there. Um, what are the things that you think have, that, that you've learned over the years? What do you think that other churches could, could perhaps learn from Dundonald and others there? In this, in this particular area? Yeah, I'm not very keen on trying to tell other grandmothers how to suck eggs. Um, so I'm not very keen on trying to tell other churches what to do. Um, but God has grown the work at uh, Dundonald and the, the great little group of pastors and workers that just met is testament to that. Um, I do think when Jesus looked you know, Jesus was generally right. <laughs> you know, when he, when he looked out at the crowds, he had compassion on them uh, with literally gut-wrenching compassion uh, for the people that he saw. And uh, what he said is, um, the harvest is plentiful. Look, but the workers are few. We need more workers. Jesus was right. He's always been right. We just need more workers. And uh, it seems to me the defining activity of a church is Bible teaching. But the purpose of the Bible teaching is to um, nurture disciples who worship God expressed in lives of holy evangelism. And so uh, we want to equip and encourage everybody with the Bible uh, for lives of holy evangelism, to maximize their gospel ministry as the people they are. And... Um, of course, it's, it's different for different people. But when you, if you have able young people, especially those who've had the privileges of family and education and have gifts for ministry, I want to encourage them to uh, maximize their gospel ministry. And I'm, pre I'm prepared to be quite brutal about that. Um, you know, one of the things I will say to the, in the, cl the clergy in the Church of England in our country, a quarter don't believe that God created the world. Sorry, a fifth don't believe that God created the world. A quarter don't believe that Christ died for our sins on the cross. A third don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead physically. And a half don't believe that Jesus is the only way to salvation. That's the clergy. So that means that a third of the clergy aren't even Christians because they don't believe Jesus rose from the dead. So I want to say to an apprentice, listen, you're a Christian. You're already ahead a third of the clergy of this country. You know, we don't need you to be John Stott. Just be a Christian. That's a good start. 
Um, and often with young, able people of privilege, they can be trained. And I often say that there are older men and women in the congregation who would love to be in the situation where you are now. They've got converted later in life. They would give their right arm to be able to start earlier serving the Lord to maximize their gospel ministry. They're prepared to pay for you to do it. And, you know, you always think there are crowds of people somewhere else. There are not. You know, there are a few churches like ours willing to raise up workers. It's us. We've, we've got to do it. We've got to get on with it. And um, would you want to say, keep going on this? Well, so what is it? So Monday morning, a group of us go back. We sit down at our desks. Thursday morning, probably. Um, we're not all in Cape Town. Um, get back to your desk. You've got all the urgent things pressing in on you, sermon, admin, whatever it is. But off the back of this conference, what are, what are some of the practical things? Let's say you've, you've, in your church you've actually never quite been able to identify someone for full-time work. What would be some of the first steps, first six months? What might that look like to try and build some <coughs> momentum in this area? Well, just to o- unload some stuff. I mean, you know, fir- firstly... You've got to get your head in gear. I'm here about raising the next generation. Okay? They will go further than I will. They'll stand on our shoulders. It's about the next generation. It's about those kids. You know, commission is all about those children. Everything we're doing is in those kids. They are the future of Christianity, certainly in our network of churches and across the country. So firstly, get your head in gear about the quality of children's ministry um, and start talking to them about serving. You know, you, you give the kids um, exposure to people at other churches. I mean, one of the most moving things at our festival is when a nine-year-old sta- you know, stands on stage and prays, Dear Lord Jesus, please help us to, church, to plant 60 more churches by 2025 so people can learn about Jesus. Amen. You think that's what we want. We want kids who know what we're trying to do and are passionate about it. We interviewed a kid Oh, that's a lot better. <laughs> at, our, at the um, youth camp, that uh, I, I again, just to get your head head around this, uh, I went to be the task force leader for the 15 students at the new Contagious camp, and lots of guys at my stage don't bother doing that sort of thing because I'm 57 and I look 107. But I still think, I think that's an absolutely key thing to do. Is that what, is that what did, did he just, he just clicked, Nick. Um, so children, teenagers. It, so in the applications of your sermons, things that you might do, one of the things you might do is to consider full-time paid ministry. You know, it's in, it's in, the, applica- it's in the outbox of every, uh, in your head at every talk. When people come to church, at our church, I sit at the back. I'm looking at the, at the, at the, uh, the back of the, the people. And we're always looking for people of, of ability and potential. It's not just the guys, though it is particularly the young men who will be trained as pastors. And it, it's kind of you know, we've got to focus on raising them up. Um, so when you go back, first you might be thinking about who, who are the young men in our congregation who with some training could, could, could be trained to go somewhere, could do something more. And uh, so firstly, you're, you're looking for them. Um, secondly, you need to coordinate so that the things that are necessary, for example, Vaughan Robert, Roberts and I started something called 938, after Matthew 938, uh, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send more workers out in the harvest field. That is to create conferences, um, firstly for students, and secondly for those who are in the workplace, and then thirdly, I do the apprentices conference every January, uh, the ministry trainees. So in other words, students often get keen and enthusiastic at university, you want to stay in touch with them once they've left university, so you need a medium to do that, to run the network, uh, to get them to conferences, to keep in touch with them. And if they're not going to do full-time ministry, try and get them to contribute financially for those that will. That, re- that will require a regional coordination, so maybe pastors getting together to talk about how can we do that regionally. 
uh, talking about the students. Um, so you've got kids, schools, camps, students, workers, ministry trainees, um, full-time gospel ministry. And at every stage, you want to think, how can I as an individual, we as a church, us as a collection of churches, a region of churches, uh, a region of churches across denominations and in the national scene, how can we work together to get these pipelines established so there's a regular through flow of people? And of course, um, once you've got a ministry trainee in your church, um, you know, you want to interview them and to, to celebrate them. And um, obviously, they've got tra training, head, heart, and hands, uh, theology, uh, character, and skills. And um, you, you want to establish with the young people that this is a thing to aspire to be. Now, to get the best guys out of um, into ministry, particularly in this culture, I mean, I mean certainly the white guys we meet in, in um, London are incredibly strong. I mean, South Africans are, are known for being so stubborn. And, and that, of course, is a great strength. I imagine that to survive in this country, you have to be incredibly stubborn. Um, I don't know, but, but they are incredibly strong. And it makes them great at rugby. Um, but that means you have to, if I may say, you have to push really hard to get a young guy out of his career. So, I, you know, I, I, I'm going to say to a young worker here in South Africa, as in London, I'm going to say, are you going to be average? Or are you going to, be, going to make your life count for something? I mean, there are hundreds of thousands of lawyers. We don't need another lawyer. Um, we need more gospel workers. Uh, are you going to be a spectator? Or are you going to get on the pitch of play? Those of us on the pitch, we're, we're knackered, we're exhausted, we need help. Are you just going to watch and applaud? Or are you going to get on the pitch? When you look, think of the people that you admire in 10 years' time. Who are the people you listen to? Who are the people you'd like to be like? Uh, you've got to make the decisions to get yourself on that pathway. You don't just turn into Murray Anderson overnight. You have to make some decisions that set you on that pathway. Normally, of course, Satan inflames all kinds of tempting distractions. So um, when Murray, I was recruiting Murray, he, got, he landed the biggest BBC contract of his life. Absolutely typical. So I, I say to the guys, you're likely to get the best offer you've ever had now. Uh, ignore it, uh, because we need you on the pitch for the sake of the gospel. People are dying. They're going to hell. They're going to suffer forever. Come and join us uh, and, and do something useful with your life. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Um, what, what's been so encouraging in this conference is actually to see the number of apprentices and ministry trainees here. Um, any specific words of application, just I guess from Acts 20, but any general wisdom for guys who are early on in full-time ministry? I, I, I don't know. Um, you've made the right decision. It is such a privilege to be involved in gospel ministry. You will not regret it in the long term, and in the very long term, you'll be absolutely thrilled. Um, I think that the difference, you know, your, your friends who are in the early years of their career, you will know they earn more than you, they have more material comforts than you. The difference will become huge in 15, 20 years' time when your friends are in massive houses or massive, you know, really, you know, all the material things and you haven't. But I want to tell you the value of seeing someone whom you've taught the gospel become a Christian, the, the, the joy of seeing someone you've discipled uh, leading someone else to Christ, preaching. Those joys far outweigh, just, they're just so much more valuable. I worked as a commercial lawyer. Uh, I met with the senior partner of the firm who was my trainer and, and a colleague of mine uh, for dinner recently, they probably earn half a million or a million a year each pounds. Uh, they're enormously wealthy. And I listened to them talking about their lives, and I just thought, I don't want anything of what you've got. I've got everything that I need in gospel ministry. Uh, what a joy. What a joy it is. So um, you've made the right decision is the first thing. The second thing to say is... Um, you know, obviously you need to learn and listen. Don't be, don't be discouraged by the fact that you can't do stuff yet. I mean, you should have seen these guys when they started. They were useless. 
Um, but but you see them now, and, and they've learned a thing or two. I mean, listening to Puni earlier, you know, the, um, Johann Verster. Um, <laughs> him and Turby, they weren't Christians when they arrived, you know, in London. And uh, they knew nothing. And look at, listening to what they're doing now, it's fantastic. So if you're at the beginning and you're young, don't be discouraged that you don't know anything yet. I hope you do know that you don't know anything yet, and therefore you're, li you're listening and writing notes and spending time and copying those who, you are, who are your seniors. Learn from them, but don't be discouraged. Um, 30 years' time, uh, there's lots of things you'll be able to do that you can't do now. So I really just want to encourage you. Uh, keep going. Just um, one more before we hand over to the floor. So you've, you've been in the country now a couple of weeks. You've, you've had a few trips out here before. You've got links to South Africa. Perhaps just on your, on your reflections over the past two weeks, maybe one or two things that you've been really encouraged to see uh, and that you'd want us to kind of keep going in and do more and more of. But then maybe one or two kind of red flags that you've, you know, often it takes an outsider to just see things that we've become blind to. Um, I think... Um, I do want you to understand how blessed you are. I mean, you could not find an Anglican gathering in the UK like this. I mean, this is, this is an extraordinary thing to be with so many brothers and sisters who are like-minded and uh, across very disparate communities. Satan will want to divide you constantly. Uh, he loves doing that. Um, so you need to resist all those prejudices and all those jealousies and envies. You know envy, put Jesus on the cross? Envy. That's what killed Jesus. I, I used to, I, I couldn't, for the first 20 years of my life, I couldn't work out how women are sinful. Um, because, because, you know, I mean, men's sins are obvious. You know, I, you know, I knew my own sins. I, could, I thought women just, they're just perfect. They don't do anything wrong. And then I discovered the sin of envy. Oh, my goodness. I thought, oh, now I know how women are civil. Anyway. <laughs> Sorry, it's probably different. I'm sure it's different here in London, but um, here, here in South Africa, but in London. Uh, but envy is a very serious thing, and Satan will try and inflame that. Um, I think you guys are hardened to need um, because you see so much deprivation, and I can't understand what that does to you what that means is it, it, it does make you less generous. South Africans in London are not generous. I don't think. I mean, I don't know. The, I don't think they're generous. And I think it's partly, you know, in the UK, we've got the sort of national health system and the social welfare. No one's going to starve to death. Right? Whereas in this country, presumably a lot of people do um, or, or certainly live in deprivation. So I, I, I realize I, I don't quite know what I'm seeing but I don't see generosity here. Now, I don't mean, I, I mean, there's certain guilt-ridden generosity. I, I, I don't mean that. I mean a willingness to let somebody else thrive, to actually help them thrive. Now, you've got to be wise. You, we don't want guilt-ridden throwing money at somebody just because they're black or they're white or they're Afrikaans or something. I mean, that's a recipe for disaster. and it'll, it'll cut off all generosity. So you need to be smart about investing in, in, in people and churches of potential and, uh, and, and godliness and, and ability because we want more of it. We want it to work so that, it, that more of it happens. But um, the power of people, churches, partnering and financing each other um, could be re wonderful, I think. And I also think there's... Sorry, I'm onto the critiques thing. So. You didn't say a single positive thing. <laughs> oh, listen, the steak here is wonderful. I mean, the steak is amazing. Oh, um, some wonderful things. Uh, I, I've been teaching the Bible here, and I've been wonderfully received everywhere. It's as if you guys actually want to hear the Bible being taught. Uh, you're not arrogant to think that you've got nothing to learn. You're teachable. Um, you're... you're um, theologically, uh, confessionally conservative and true to the Bible, that is a wonderful thing. You should, you know, not to, to be fighting liberals all the time uh, is a wonderful joy, and it's a wonderful culture of Christian welcome. You, you have bishops and leaders who are gospel people. 
That's a fantastic thing. And um, there's been lots of church planting, lots of churches. I also think, if I may observe, it's the same in our country. The previous generation, there were some towering personalities, quite difficult to work with. They didn't work well together because they were pioneers, survivors in a very small minority. They had to be powerful, stubborn mules who just kept preaching the gospel. The next generation in our country, there are no towering John Stotts or Dick Lucases. But actually, that's a great opportunity because it means that those of us who are slightly more average can work together on a level playing field. So some of us, we can work together better because no one's the dominating, towering personality. I think in your generation, each region, I'm meeting able uh, leaders who can cooperate and work together without competing because no one's the dominating, powerful personality. So I think there's a and that's white and black leaders working together. I think this is a tremendous moment of opportunity for you. And when those leaderships emerge, if you're not one of those people involved in it, can I urge you, do not be envious, competitive, stubborn, unwilling to listen. When those leaders emerge, let them and support them. You'll all have different things to contribute. But you know how it is if you're not in the inner crew and there's so much infighting and division is caused by that. But if we, if collectively as a, as a culture, you can welcome emerging partnerships of pastors and, and support them rather than, you know, that's fine, get on with it, but you don't play, play team. You know, the rugged individualist can absolutely ruin networks. So I, I do think you're in a generation when looking at what's happening, there are regional networks emerging, pastors who know and love and trust each other. You all seem to respect each other. Just resist Satan's inflaming of envy and competition amongst you. And you might really establish some, some, you might really establish some, some training pipelines and see scale in the next generation. Lots of kids. I mean, that student work, that conference, you know, 50 kids putting their names down saying, I'm willing to consider the next, the next step. Well, that needs to be in every region, and, and you need more camps, you know, multiply camps, uh, protect those student ministries and invest in them, and play team, and you'll do more together. And, and the, the old Anglican ways where bishops control everything, one of the things, um, or, or leaders control everything, um, that era is gone. We're not hierarchical in the West, and you'll become less hierarchical over time as the younger generations um, are infected by the internet um, with with very individualistic uh, ideals. Um, but instead, if if institutions can support emerging um, teams and pastors and so on, so one of the things in commission that we we try and do is rather than tax the churches. We're trying to support the churches. So my role as director of commission is I'm trying to find money for the churches. I'm trying to find workers for the churches. I'm trying to establish partnerships that will help, help the pastors. I'm trying to encourage the pastors to get mentors. Uh, I'm listening to them saying, you know, what do you need? What can I help you with? If they haven't got music directors. How can I find you some music directors? So that they say, we love being part of commission. We love it because they support us. They look up, you know, rather than taxing the churches saying, you know, it's your job to keep us going. And incidentally, once you start doing that, patrons now start funding the center because the center is supporting the churches. So um, I have no idea whose toes I'm stepping on there, but I'm just saying just to keep seeing the local church as the front line and everything else, all the parachurch organizations, you know, you're not taxing the churches, saying you should turn up to our missions conference, you should turn up to our this conference or that conference or the rest of it. Rather say, what do the churches need? How can we serve the churches in building scale pipelines, leaders, and populations so that we can cover this country, this continent, with, with Bible teaching pastors and people in churches? Thank you. Guys, questions from the floor. Um, you're welcome to come up and use the mic. If you don't want to do that, just stand up. And oh, there's a roving mic over there. Subu's got a roving mic. Uh, nice and loud. And um, Richard will do his best to answer.
Um, my son was in Stellenbosch when you, sorry, in, in Cape Town when you were there, and you coined the phrase magnetic moms. Could you elaborate on what they are and how they operate and how they grow churches? Magnetic mums. Um, yes. Uh, it, it, where we were in Dundonald, just to give you an example so you understand, um, there, were, there were two families. There was a family who, who got conv- where the husband got converted and they moved to Worcester Park, which is a suburb just a uh, sort of 10-minute drive away from where we are but a separate, separate community, really, residential community. And then another couple arrived. He'd been an apprentice with me, fantastic couple, and they moved to Worcester Park as well. And I thought those two women are godly and magnetic people. They gather people around them. They're, they're, uh, they're just really wonderful women. And one of them was a governor on the, on the school, on the Green Lane School, and I thought to myself, those two couples, that both the men and especially those mums, you could build a community around them. I went to see them um, about four months after we moved into our factory building and said, I wonder whether you'd be willing to think about praying for a church, plant a church. They were horrified because they'd just moved into, we'd just got our first building. Their kids had their first Sunday school to belong to with more than five children because they've both been in planted churches before. And I said to them, look, what you could do is you could plant an afternoon church and come to our church in the morning with the kids for Sunday school and plant in the afternoon. I said, look, just just think about it. Uh, A month later, they rang me up and said, no, we're on for it. We'll do it in the morning. Honestly. People like that. I'm increasingly getting tearful of thinking about what, what that means for two families who've not had a Sunday school for years and years, finally moving to a building. We brought four congregations together. They finally had a Sunday school. And within six months, the pastor's saying, please, you could go back to tiny church. That was a big sacrifice for them. But they said, we're up for that. And basically, those mums and other families started trickling out there because it was a, a cheaper place to live than where we are. And so some families started moving. I thought, this is going to be, a, we'll bleed people there constantly. Uh, it's really good sense. And so um, those mums uh, at the school gates, it, see, secondary school people are, are, are serious about education. They're not looking for friends. But at, at primary school, initial first school, new mums are looking for friends. Um, they're looking for somebody to look after. Could you look after my kids while I go to the shops? You know, I'm late, for, late. could you pick them up? Can we, should we do a party? To, all sorts of things, young mums, first mums, second, you know, second child, all sorts of things they do. They're looking for a support community in our, in our context, I reckon, everywhere. Once you've got that support, support community, you don't need it. So secondary schools are, are useless for planting churches in. Primary schools are brilliant because you get another 100 mums coming through every time. And if you can get involved and start something and access the, the, the book bags that the kids take home with invitations to Christmas services and so on. I mean, so at Dundonald School, which is why we're called Dundonald Church, um, I began to get involved there. All my kids went through there. That's critical because mm. parents are much more, have a, have, a, have a right to be involved. And you attend things, you go to things. Every Saturday night, I'd be at a sort of parents' drinks party or something. You know, don't be the Christian that turns up at eight with grape juice and goes home at nine and doesn't get to know anybody. You, you know, and it, it did mean I was tired on Sundays. But we were befriending everybody and getting to know people. And, you know, in, in Wimbledon, you do dinner parties and meals together. It could be a braai. Um, I don't know, but you, you're part of the community. Every time I go to the Sunday school park, just swinging the swings, accessing those parents. Oh, do you know the school? Your kids go to the school. Okay, we meet in the school. Have you been? You should come along. Um, and then doing assemblies. Uh, I started a rugby club called the, called the Dundonald Rhinos. We got the local wine bar to support the rugby club, and he, he came and helped coach. He wasn't very good, but anyway, got built a rugby club. <laughs> After school, but just get involved in the community. And the mums who are befriending each other bring people along to the church and build a church community. And that church is now uh, sort of 90 adults uh, in, in the school hall, all built around the magnetic mums. Um, hi. In the morning, we discussed five kinds of money, right? Top of the list was giving. And you said um, vision drives giving. So if... We're planning to plant a church in a seriously poverty-stricken area. 
does the statement apply or must we at least have a five-year plan that says we'll continuously look for funding to grow the gospel or whatever in the area? I didn't recognize the names of, of where you, you mentioned, but um, when I say the vision drives giving, obviously people can only give what they have. You know, the widow only had a dime. She gave all that she had. Uh, and that is incredibly precious. All I'm saying is that if you want people to give as, as much as they can give, um, it's vision that, that drives that. So it's not just saying you should give, and people should, but you're also saying, and if we give, then together we can do so much more together than we can on our own. You know, I know that the children's worker sounds expensive. You know, none of us can do this on our own. None of us can finance but together we might be able to pay so that she could go part-time. Uh, we could Together we can pay for a part-time children's worker. So, but you've got to clarify what the vision is. Why do you want a children's worker? So because we want to, be, we want to establish um, a, a church that really is a family in this township where people have never experienced coherent family before. And if we're going to do family, we need to look after children well. And I, I have no idea as you understand how to build a church in a township. But you've got to try and think beyond just, we need a children's worker. Why do we need a children's worker? Because we want to become this kind of church to reach these kinds of people. And we can do that if we have this resource. So we need to collectively finance this resource. How much can we give? And sometimes you can ask, how much can we give? And then you, you so there's the general appeal, but there's also private conversations. Uh, with individuals, especially those who've got a bit more money, to say, look, how are you feeling? Do you feel supportive of this vision? Say, no, I was wondering why you do, why are we doing such a thing? I thought we should. Do. Can I talk to you about that? And then you try and pick off individuals and, uh, uh, yeah, anybody else you know who shares that? Why don't the two of you, why don't we have coffee together and we'll talk about it? And you win them over to the vision. Now, in clarifying the vision, of course, if you just arrive with a vision and announce it and you haven't talked to anybody, it's probably the wrong thing. So what I do is I trail the ideas to hear how people respond. Then I start clarifying it with my uh, team. Then I come up with the best way of presenting it simply and as colorfully and passionately as I can. And then I present it um, as the thing we're going to do for the coming year. And momentum is everything. You've got to keep clarifying what the next steps are in the church life. And uh, as I often say, you don't have to be right, just be certain. Um, but before deciding what you're going to do, take counsel with people whose, whose uh, opinion you trust. Win your leaders over, your senior staff, then your elders, uh, and then present to the church, present it clearly, and spend time over the presentation so it's clear and compelling. And then keep driving that, repeating it and reinforcing it, as they were saying at the Lickpunt presentation. So at, at whatever scale that is, people will give more for what they believe in. But if they don't know why they're giving, why would they give? That's, that's what I'm saying. Okay. Paul says in verse 29, he uses the phrase, help the weak, or better to give than to receive. And when I understand that you describe them as being Paul's helpers in need of financial resources which he raised for them, but Paul uses the same phrase in 1 Thessalonians, help the weak. In the context, he talks about encouraging the timber and so forth. Do those phrases refer to the same, or can they be to different people? In the Thessalonian passage, it seems to be spiritual weak. Can Paul be saying the same thing here in Acts, or is he just referring to those in financial need? I missed some of that because the microphone was blurring your voice. You're saying the verse, uh, helping the weak is a phrase verse, used in 1 Thessalonians? Verse, yeah, 1 Thessalonians, he also uses the phrase, help the weak. I'm asking, is Paul referring to the same group of people in Acts and in Thessalonians, or is he referring to two different groups um, of people yes. with different needs? Thank you. I, I think he, he's quoting a general principle, helping the weak. So it's a general principle that applies in all areas of life, that we help the weak. But what's interesting in Acts 20 is that his example, when he says, in this way, we help the weak, his example of helping the weak is 
working as a tanner to raise funding for his gospel team. So I think helping the weak in one Thessalonians has a much more general um, meaning, as we would say, helping the weak, helping those who are weak. But in Acts 20, his example of doing that is raising funding for gospel workers. And that's really surprising to me, because we don't normally think about gospel workers as the weak. Except when you think about ministry trainees, I think about those, those students wondering how they're going to do. They're going to abandon their, you know, they just spent three years at university learning to do engineering. Their family are hoping they're going to support the family, you know, with their income from, and they're about to abandon all that. That is a hugely costly thing for them to do. Um, but so they're weak. They don't know how to find money. They don't know anybody who has money. Uh, they don't have any money. And so the Apostle Paul is saying he works very hard to help his team. And he sees that as an example of helping the weak. So um, what I'm saying is it's a general principle, as you say in 1 Thessalonians as well. But an example of helping the weak is to be a team leader raising funds for others. And I noticed that in South Africa, where the consequences financially are more serious, especially for uh, those Africans with family in other countries or in poorer communities, where so much depends upon that student or that young person earning money and giving to their family, we have to recognize that. We don't just leave them there on their own, struggling, or watch while they don't take up gospel ministry. They've got the passion for it. They've got the gifting for it. They just can't because they've got starving parents who need money. Well, those of us who are leaders in churches need to help them. And in this way, we're helping the weak. And it is more blessed to give than to receive. In other words, God will be more pleased with us in eternity that we were able to help those weak, those gospel workers, than if we've kept the money and had more comfortable chairs in church or were able to buy a second car for our family. Does that make sense? Just um, let me jump in with one question quickly. So um, we know that God has really worked through a commission and churches there to raise up, you know, to plant new churches. Um, I've heard you say before that you spend more and more time as you travel around the UK and around the world actually cautioning churches against planting. Um, so first question is, what, what are some of the things that a mother church should be should give them cause for concern or caution before they plant? But then secondly, if it is right for them to plant, what are some of the things that need to be in place before they press the button? Brilliant question. Well done. Um, well done, Murray. Sorry. <laughs> uh, this man is brilliant strategically, by the way. Um, Anna's a Bible teacher, actually. A jolly good bloke, generally, actually. Um, moving on. A jolly good bloke. Yes. <laughs> Was it Brew? Did they call you Brew? Or? Anyway, but. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so it's such fun, isn't it, meeting in different cultures? Well, I think it's fun, anyway. Um, listen, in our context, a context, yes, people do sometimes ring up saying, um, Richard, we're, we're thinking of planning a church, and uh, just wondering if you tell us what to do. You know, I think, really, what, in, on a phone call? Um, so, so firstly, it is great that you've got church planting residences and training courses, and we're trying to set up a planting academy in London. You do the same here. Um, the other thing you can do is occasional consultations. So I do consultations where pastors travel to come and chat and spend a day presenting their situation in an hour, and we just press that. And, and so you might get through five churches in a day, but listening to how you're thinking is enormously helpful for the 20 who are listening. So you might like to do a, consulta a regional consultation where pastors gather once a year, once a term, whatever, and just hear some experienced church planting, prosecuting the plans. Now, I will say to the person, so how many adults are you? And they say, 120. And so you say, okay, and um, what were you five years ago? And they say, 120. To which I then say to them, so why will planting help, help the gospel grow? So well, isn't that what planting do? I said, no, if you plant 30 people from the 120, that 30 people don't know how to grow a church. And all you'll leave then is a smaller church that doesn't know how to grow a church. You'll probably just kill both. So the key thing is, do you know how to grow the church? Now, obviously, the gospel is the heart of all that. But it's also the gospel, then with a contextualized ministry, to reach the particular community that you're trying to reach. Okay? 
So firstly, I would say, for goodness sake, a church that doesn't know how to grow, don't plant. First of all, you've got to try and find a way to grow. When you've found a way to grow and the church is then growing, the question is, do you know why it's growing? And if you do know why it's growing, can you train other people in how to grow? Once they've learned how the church grows, let's say you've grown from 120 to 150, then you can lose 30 people down the road, and the 120 will resume its growth to 150, and the 30 down the road have a good chance of growing to a church of 150. But for goodness sake, don't plant if the people you're planting with don't know how to engage in ministry to grow a church. All you're doing is making your church smaller. Okay? So I think a lot of churches, people forget that at Dundonald, we didn't plant. We planted our first church. We went multi-site quite quickly, but that was just me rushing around doing the same sermon in whatever different places and different staff and so on. One church. We didn't plant a first separate church until six years after we'd started. And then we planted two the year later with people who'd been with us from very early on. And it was still quite slow that we planted another one two years later and then it started to speed up because people had been with us long enough now they all knew how we were growing and so you could plant any of them and then we planted you know to a year we've had a bit of a gap in the last couple of years uh, about five are going out this year now that's because we've been going long enough with sustained patterns of growing ministry for people to learn so I do want to encourage you don't plant too quick and don't plant too small um, I think it's a mistake we've made. We've, we've done a pioneering thing. Um, those who had good core teams have, have grown well. Um, but those who've had very small planting teams have really struggled. And for some of them, they're spending f five years just getting to the point, the same point as we'd plant with a team. And they're just draining resources in those five years. So, you know, I think Al Bart from City to City is right when he observes that in, ge in general... You know, we're in a hurry to go public and we're in a hurry to plant too small. And so I would, it isn't just, you know, plant, 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 that's the answer to everything. No, it's uh, have growing churches to plant growing plants uh, with sufficient resources. The six Ps we're looking for when you plant a church, firstly, place, you work out where you're going to go, which community you're trying to reach, and a venue that's appropriate there. So place. Um, second, you need a planter somebody who's trained and, and knows how to plant, and if you're remaining networked, who has your DNA, uh, so, so they know how to plant. Uh, so planter, uh, people, so core, core team, uh, and particularly to have a mature lay family, preferably more than one, uh, where you can find one lay elder who can model for the rest of the church what being church membership looks like and can, can speak to you about how the rest of the church are feeling. So don't plant with one leader, always plant with two, uh, or more if you can, but especially have some mature lay families. The quality of our church planting is almost uniquely, well, it's specially influenced by the quality of the senior elders. Those families, I can tell you those families who finance and model and pray and they lead the church. I mean, you, could, you can buy good clergy off the, off the clergy conveyor belt, but families who believe the gospel, they're gold. So uh, core team, I wouldn't appoint other elders too quickly. Let them serve for a year and prove themselves. So be slow to appoint. Uh, that's a core team. That's people. Uh, pounds, uh, you need money, and um, you need to plan that carefully, and that's where being networked can be helpful. Uh, it may be a, a denomination can be helpful, but you need pump priming money. Um, uh, fourthly, you need plans. So it's not just, hey, we're going to plan, we're going to plant, and it's not either, is it? It's not also, uh, we're just going to do what we did at Mother Church. Uh, you need more than that. You need to plan how are we actually going to reach the community we're trying to reach with the people we've got. I mean, sometimes you dream of reaching the Zulu community, but the people you send are all, um, you know, Afrikaners. I, I, I don't know the cultural things, but, you know, you, you've got the wrong people to reach the wrong community. There's no point dreaming of reaching a community you haven't got people who can reach it. So with the people we've got to plant with, who could we reach? Um... So you've got to have sensible plans. And um, I, I wouldn't launch too quickly. When you do launch, you have multiple launches. So you have your, your first public meeting, and then you let everybody know you have a couple of 
festivals, then you have your first public one, then you have a guest speaker, and you have another launch. So, you, so people get the opportunity to be at the start of things about four times before you actually get going. Um, and think about key festivals and how they're useful. So that's uh, plans. Um, partnerships. You need to talk to local churches. You don't want to plant in the backyard of another excellent church and then just compete over the same people. So you need to partner with other churches and other networks. You know, talk to leaders and denominations. Just say, look, we'd like to. What do you think? We're coming. Uh, generally, Anglicans are possessive, and everyone else is generous. That's just uh, you have to live with that. Um, and and uh, so, but try and you know lay the ground. And what's the one I forgot? Well, the seventh one should be prayer. Uh, pray like mad. In the first two years that uh, we planted our church, um, I spent the first two years visiting uh, the potential leading men every week, so about 10 of them, go around to their homes, read the Bible, pray. Those 10 guys became the elders in our church, and most of those guys became planting senior elders in churches that went off because I spent time with them in those first two years. The other thing I did uh, every morning in those first two years, never done it since, I prayed for an hour. I've never done that since, but those two first two years, um, I did because God will wants to be glorified, and us to enjoy Him, and uh, to respond to prayer. So pray, make prayer uh, critical at the beginning. Um, it's probably something else I missed. Can, can you give us your wisdom on this? Um, yeah, is an eighteen year old still very young? Um, this 18-year-old wants nothing else to do but to come to ministry and serve the Lord full-time. Well, what's your wisdom on this? Peter, why don't you try without the microphone? The mic's distorting a bit. Can you shout loud without the microphone? It might be easier to hear. Okay. <laughs> okay. No, no, try without the mic because the way we're hearing the mic here, it's a bit distorted. So it might be clearer if you just speak really loudly. Sorry. Thank you. So, so much clearer. Thank you so much. Yeah, 18-year-old coming out of high school, keen to serve the Lord. Um, again, I think it's um, in the UK that it's quite common to have a gap year um, and to have a year, I think there's somebody here actually from uh, South England, there she is, um, doing exactly that, come here to work with at uh, CCM here uh, to spend her gap year uh, positively. So it may be for some kids uh, they can travel. Uh, if they can't travel, then perhaps to be involved in a local church, you know, just in a helping capacity with children's work and, and that sort of thing. Um, but we also don't want to despise them just following the same track of going to university, evangelizing friends, uh, being useful and learning ministry, particularly through summer camps, um, aspiring to become a leader on the, on the camp, and indeed to go to work, earn a bit of money, um, because that can help pay for going through Bible college or through training colleges, uh, can earn a little money for two or three years. G having a job does more than just earn money. Having a job teaches you to run a diary, to take direction, uh, to work hard. You understand how exhausted people are when they come home from work. Uh, you really learn what what the real world is like. You learn how hard it is to evangelize non-Christians. So in general, doing a couple of years' work, uh, paid work, um, is a really good thing for somebody to do. So I don't want to take people out of the workplace too quickly, just as you're growing up and learning to manage yourself, manage a diary. Sometimes choose well in marriage, get married. Um, and then sometimes if you have a young working wife, she can help pay for you while you do college and other things. So I, I think as long as we stay in touch with those y young people and keep them enthusiastic about gospel ministry, it can be a great time of learning even though they're not full-time paid. Does that make sense? So I don't, you know, when you're, when you're only 18, it's too young to be very useful. So um, you want to stay in touch, get them involved in leadership, um, uh, on camps, evangelizing friends, learning the basics of life and life as a Christian. And I think actually that makes for a pastor who doesn't expect too much of their congregation, you know, who understands. Do you understand what you're asking your people to do here? They're going to come home from work. They won't have had a meal. They're coming out to Bible study. You keep them there for two hours. They're exhausted. They go home. 
you will kill the church because they can't keep up with your unrealistic expectations. Work really helps you with that. Uh, but it also teaches you about evangelism. You know, yo, evangelize your friends. You know, preach to the office. You know. <laughs> Have you ever done that, mate? No. <laughs> so I just think being realistic and appreciating uh, normal people is really helpful. But you need to stay in touch with them so that their zeal for the Lord doesn't diminish. That's why you need your 938 equivalents. That's why you need camps and more camps to keep training leaders. Camps are not just to keep the kids busy during the holidays. It's not even just to evangelize the children and to encourage and strengthen them. It's to train leaders. Those leadership teams. I gather there's a, a Dave Hill's got a great one down in the Cape, but it's big. So divide it, multiply it, divide it and multiply. So I remember the camp that I was in in uh, 1998 is now represented by about 20 camps. Just dividing, as soon as you grow bigger, that's 20 times the numbers of people and 20 times the number of leaders learning the basics of gospel ministry in, the te in a leadership team on a camp. That, that sort of thing is vital. Chit, could you uh, make some comments, observations, thoughts on church rejuvenation as a gospel strategy. Uh, I just am struck that as a denomination, we're at an age where I think that probably is something we need to begin thinking about. Thank you, yes. Church rejuvenation, uh, in the UK, we, we, we're basically saying it's twin track. So church re rejuvenation and church planting. In, in, in different cultures, people favor one or the other. And I actually think we just need both. Um, in a declining denomination like the Church of England, you know, there are buildings with diminishing congregations. Um, and sometimes they will accept an evangelical ministry coming in. So I think church rejuvenation is vital. But there are some people in the UK who imply that church planting is crazy and the only right way to do the gospel work is church rejuvenation. And I would point some of them to the fact that you've got some of your best and ablest leaders spending their entire life trying to turn a church around, and 40 years in, they still haven't got their PCC on site. And I'm thinking, really, was that the best we could have done with that able leader? But because they didn't know how to church plant, they never considered planting a new church. Um, so I think if you're going to rejuvenate a church, you still need the courage of a planter. You still need, you know, there's going to be blood on the carpet. You're going to lose half the congregation. Um, so I, I don't want church rejuvenation to be seen as the easy option because I don't want you to do it in an easy way, but it should be done. So church rejuvenation is, is a vital thing. I mean, Murray's, um, now your situation's different, isn't it? But, but there are plenty of churches where you, you go to and the congregation has aged and needs somebody with a fresh vision to come in. And uh, of course, if there's been Bible ministry in the past, as there was at St. Peter's, then you can really build on that because people are longing for it. But in other churches, they're not longing for it, and you've got to take a lot of criticism, and the people will complain, and the people will leave, blessed subtractions, and then you start again. And you start with um, um, you know, your, your small group, your Bible study, your evening course, uh, and gradually that number of people grows. And you may keep some things ticking over uh, on a Sunday morning while the real life, which is the young family's congregation, you, you grow fresh. And... Um, I mean, there's lots of things to say about how to do that, as you know. But I think it's twin track. You need both. Do you want to come back to me on that? Because I know you do. you're a very thoughtful leader. You know lots about this. I mean, do both. You know, don't be crazy church planters, because if they all fail, everyone will give up on church planting. So you want effective, well-resourced, I think, networked plants. We used to talk about, you know, blue sky over your head's um, safety net under your feet. So in our church planting, we're saying, you're trained, here's a group of people, here's a venue, uh, you're f we'll, we'll look after the finances for you, we'll pump prime you, we're there for you. We'll keep leading people to you, we won't leave you alone. Three years in, you've lost some families, we'll ask some more to join you. You need a children's worker, we'll share one with you. You need a music director, we'll, give you, we'll share a music director, we'll train, come to our training things. Your kids need youth group, Come, why don't you, the kids come to the youth group, but stay there. And you say to the, guy, to the guys there, 
you'd rather die than go. And if you go and it doesn't work and you come back, that's a courageous thing to have done. And you celebrate the effort poured into that and say, well done. We've closed two of our plants. We have, they're great leaders. They just couldn't get going. And so after four, five, six, seven years, you just say, okay, let's call time. We'll regroup and we'll head out again. We'll do something else one day soon. So you honor those plants that don't work as well as those that, that do, but don't set them up to fail by leaving them isolated and under-resourced. Because all that will do, I mean, you might save some money in the short term, but in the long term, no one will want to plant. People will just say, it's crazy, it doesn't work. So you need your plants to work. Especially if you're a network or a larger church, you need your first plant to work. Because then people, and then gradually, they shell out much more quickly. Because people just get used to plant. It's something you're constantly doing. But church rejuvenation is a different, there are different skills. You need to be patient. Some of the, the pastors, you know, you don't want to try and keep people while you educate them. So people like Ruth Standring um, and uh, Paul Dawson uh, and others back in the UK who've rejuvenated for us. I mean, Rue went there, he wore, you know, shirt and collar, and, you know, there was a crucifix on the wall behind him, and, a, you know, it was Catholic stuff. I couldn't have stood it. I'd have taken the sledgehammer to it uh, week one. But it, he, he was much more patient, which was wise. In the end, he worked out nobody had any clue why the box had a red light on it. And so that just disappeared, and the, the cross got turned around, and gradually the table got emptied and moved to the side, and... You know, and gradually people forgot what the furniture was all about and got on with people were getting saved and young people coming in. So rejuvenation is a wonderful thing to do. And often, because there's a building and a vicarage and a group of people, you've often got resources to start with. And remember, the money was given by, usually by evangelicals wanting to leave money for gospel work. So um, I think rejuvenation could be a brilliant way forward. But when you're going in to turn a church around, remember the church is in this condition for a reason. So you don't just arrive thinking, I'll just arrive, it'll all go well. There must be reasons why it's so sick and diminished. So you're going to have to make changes, and it's going to be painful. So you've got to have some thick skin. But hey, you guys specialize in that. <laughs> so I'm all for it. I'm for both. We're twin track. Hello. Um, so I have two questions. Actually, it's three, but yeah. <laughs> we'll see how they go. Yeah. So um, the first one is, what is your stance on church politics? Um, is, can it be beneficial to the church? If so, how? And um, the second one is, what's your stance again on church estrangement, like when, you know, churches are just estranged. Am I using the right word? Yeah, just like... Separate. Separated um, from each other. Yeah, they're together, but separate from each other. Yeah, thank um, you. In terms of just like the congregation and all of that. Estranged. Es estranged, yes. Thank you. Church politics um, is inevitable. Um, politics just emerges from people being organized. So um, uh, church politics is a, is a reality, uh, and some people need to be sacrificially involved in it. It's sometimes a miserable business. Of course, the more positive side of it is called cooperating and strategizing, and uh, that is still church politics, but it's being done positively and creatively for the gospel. Um, but sometimes where there are uh, tendencies and drifts in church organizations. All organizations will tend to disintegrate and to drift uh, towards unsoundness, and so you need to fight and contend for them. Um, but you don't want your best gospel people tied up in that ministry f for too long because you need to grow churches on the ground. It's amazing how... Um, healthy gospel ministry on the ground wins in the end. In other words, the structures will change to accommodate gospel growth. Um, so in the early days, so we were, we've been hugely opposed for our church planting. Um, I, some of you will know that I took a stand 
on homosexual practice in, in Southwark Diocese and um, arranged for um, uh, an extremely well-known minister from nearby here uh, to come and ordain some of our people, and I was sacked for that reason. So um, I was then in a court case. Uh, we won the court case, and the, um, the benefit of all that is that the bishops are a lot more uh, wary now of pursuing evangelicals. Now, it was a painful thing, it was a miserable business, but it had to be done. You had to stand up and contend for the faith. So um, I think sometimes you can't avoid politics. As soon as you do anything of substance, it will become the source of criticism. Uh, I was chatting to somebody earlier just saying, you know, as their ministry is growing, there's more and more criticism and envy and sniping. You would not believe the criticism that some of our guys have gone through and that I've gone through from people who you think are your friends. That's the one, that's what hurts most. When people, you know, well, it is that those who, you th who, who are evangelicals or claim to be evangelicals, and they just snipe the whole time, criticizing the way you do things. You know, I was saying to somebody earlier, listening to Lick, the Lickpunt team just now, wasn't that fantastic? It's fantastic. Now, you might be running a church that does, sorry, fantastic. That's the way you say. Um, you might be um, uh, you might be doing your particular ministry differently. You know, you don't concentrate on community groups. You you concentrate on Bible handling skills. Um, but you've got to be able to appreciate what the other guys are doing. They're doing something different. It's wonderful. Celebrate it. Encourage people to go to their church. Let people train with them. Because they're gospel people doing a wonderful work. And if you lead on the generosity, you may well find that they respond. But the temptation is to criticize anybody who doesn't quite do it my way and our way, and especially when their way works. So when their way works, gets bigger. You know, they're training 100 apprentices a year. They've planted 1,000 churches. They've got 4 million people. I hate them. <laughs> you know, and that's evil. And we have to try and celebrate that and thank God for, for them. So church politics, generosity of spirit. Can I say the level of cooperation, you were saying estrangement, the level of cooperation necessary is, depends upon the task being undertaken. So let's say an anti-abortion crusade might be something you could partner with Roman Catholics and Muslims with. You don't claim it's Christian, but it's a moral campaign and you can sign, do that together. But you'd never plant a church together with, well, Muslims or, or, or Roman Catholics because they're, they're not Christians and they don't share the same gospel. So and, and when it comes to a, um, a training college, you don't just need people who are Christians. You need people who are very learned and very reformed and true to in a very a much tighter collection of beliefs. And so your statement of faith will be very tight. So for some things, like training colleges influencing the next generation, you want a very tight statement of faith. For loose fellowship, regional fellowships, your statement of faith might be a little looser, uh, but still on the authority, authority and errancy of Scripture, penal substitutionary atonement, you keep those things in, but you'd allow for different views on creation, different views on, on the millennium. Um, you might allow for different views on baptism. Um, but you can still work as a fellowship with those different views because you're Christians, you believe the gospel, okay? But then on a moral crusade, it could be a much broader alliance. So it depends on the task being undertaken for the level of unity involved. But you do need to clarify it. The other thing, of course, is the, the level of unity for the platform, so all speakers sign the typed, the tight statement of faith, but you can open the doors to anybody who comes to listen. But just need, you need to reassure people Who's going to be speaking? Who's going to be training? Who's going to be influencing? And you keep that as tight as the task requires. Does that make sense? Okay. That was two questions. Time for, time for one more, I think. Okay. Uh, there was a guy. Uh, so, Richard, uh, you made an example about uh, that single parent who came with the kids and then that second family, uh, which was uh, rich or privileged, whatever you can call it. Um, so one of the lessons I've picked up there is just the, the, the dignified way the other family is being treated in comparison to the other. Um, so can, 
can you just share your wisdom and maybe your journey as, um, as you find yourself in the other side of uh, supporting someone financially? Uh, so how do you keep your heart in check in trying to show dignity and respect to that person, um, even though you might be the one <clears throat> um, kind of giving financial support? Yeah, so my question is more on when you give financial support, you end up losing dignity for the person because you are more or less superior because of what you give. I got most of that. Um, do, do you mean, who's, who's holding dignity about what, sorry? So, so the minister. Yeah. Because so, in, your, in your moralist storytelling, yeah. uh, you were more showing this pastor who was not respecting or, or taking much time for the single parent with kid. But then on the second scenario, it was more a privileged family coming and then the pastor was more or less seen to be showing more respect and dignity yep. all the way to the kids even in greeting them. So I'm more or less saying um, when you are in a position of, um, of privilege, in this case, giving someone a financial support, how yes. do you always check your heart? Thank you, thank you. Um, yes. Um, <coughs> I, I imagine with the social diversity that you guys are working with, there's a, usually a bottomless pit of need around you, certainly where many of you live, and if you don't live in that, further afield. So I understand that you can't be foolishly generous and just spray money around, then it's all gone and you've got nothing left to give. So I realize that you need to be very careful. Um, I think with my illustration of the poor person and the wealthy person who come into church, what I'm trying to say is we need to guard our hearts that we're not after what we can get from people, but we're here to give. It may be that people are coming in with problems that are familiar, uh, social problems that we're not gonna fix, and throwing money at it is not gonna fix anything. And if we do it for one person, it won't help anybody else. But I think a general um, attitude of generosity where I may be able to help, you know, Jesus with the, um, the Samaritan, uh, the parable of Samaritan, he, he's not setting up a relief project for everybody. He's helping the one person he comes across in need. So it, it may be I can help one person well, or as a church pastor, I can organize for other people who are gifted in a particular area of need to provide, some need, to provide for those who are in need. So in Acts 6, um, the great obstacle to having seen the obstacle of persecution, and corruption within the church, as Ananias and Sapphira. Um, the next obstacle is the distraction of the pastors. So what do the apostles do? They, uh, they carefully appoint um, gifted and appropriate people to look after the needs of the people who are coming into the church um, across racial divisions. So I think what it means is, although I may not be doing the caring, and I may not need, money may not be the answer, I still need to try and make sure, as best we can as a church, that we provide for the weak amongst us as well as the strong. Um, so don't neglect the, the gifts of those who are strong, who can serve with ministry or with money. You welcome those ministries as given for the good of the whole, and be wise about how you do it, but in your heart, don't do your ministry for the rich do your ministry for the whole church. And Richard, I think, so maybe also what cuts us probing as well, in a, in say a church partnership situation, yep. where let's say a better resourced ministry is giving to a less resourced ministry, um, Katz, is this what you're getting at? So how do you, how, how do you make sure that the relationship between those two leaders, those ministry leaders, is not sort of complicated by the money and the giving? Yeah, thanks. Sorry is, if I missed the point. Is that the question. right? Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, yes, I mean, we do have that situation in commission. I think one of the things that um, we need to understand and believe and agree is that the testimony of those working in poorer situations is often unbelievably encouraging to those in more privileged situations and very challenging and you we have to generate a culture in which we don't underestimate the spiritual benefit of being in partnership with those who have some need 
and we need to keep reassuring those who are in the poorer situation. Guys, you're such an encouragement to us. Um, certainly, when I'm uh, raising money from patrons, I'll often get some of the guys from the poorer, from the housing estates. Housing estates in our place are deprived areas, dangerous areas. And I get them to talk about people who've become Christians. And the guys with the money are just, they're just so overwhelmed because they're, they're amongst people who are hard and selfish and greedy. And to hear the stories of some Iranian immigrants becoming Christians, as we did at the Revive last year, you know, a, a young single mum of four becoming a Christian, an older guy, just hearing the stories of ordinary people is heartwarming because they're Christians. So I think we need to understand that although finance may flow one way, spiritual encouragement flows the other way. And to celebrate um, those spiritual encouragements. And I think also to involve the leaders from the poorer ministries in significant leadership roles. So don't make the fact that you're part, you're, you're part of a smaller church that doesn't have money means somehow you're not in leadership. Um, so, f for example, on, on my board, to whom I'm accountable, one of the guys is a, a black pastor from one of our poorer housing estate ministries, and I'm accountable to him. So there, there are five, five of them. And um, obviously able people often do, are used by God to grow ministries, but don't re do remember the size of your church is not necessarily an indication of your godliness or your wisdom. Um, and so look for leaders who represent those poorer communities. So we're investing in a number of black pastors in, in London. I'm wanting to encourage them to feel that Jason is, is the guy who represents them on our board. And um, I want to honor them and I, uh, I love those guys. And I, I go and preach with them whenever they ask one of them um, lost his baby, so I went to do the funeral uh, for him. And I will especially work hard for them because we have got to reach those poorer communities. And I can't do that. I need those guys to, to help me do that. So um, I think to involve people from those ministries in leadership, to listen to them, and particularly listen to the cultural issues. I've got a young black pastor called Felix trying to explain to me all the cultural middle-class assumptions of the way we do uh, our, our festivals and our meetings. You know, he was explaining to me his wife finds our meetings in intimidating because everybody else just asks her questions all the time. And in his community, you don't ask questions all the time. And she feels like she's being interrogated every time she comes. And, and the middle-class white women just think they're being friendly. But it's not. It makes her feel terrible. And, but they don't know that. They mean well. But it's just, hot, you know, so he's all kinds of things. He's helping me to understand. I'm saying, please tell me. I want, I want myself as the director of commission to explain what those issues are and to own this together. Help me understand how to make our movement generally multicultural and accepting of all cultures. And um, just one example um, which I shared. You may have seen that last year in London, uh, there was a tower block that burnt down called Grenfell Tower. Uh, now, Grenfell Tower is one of the poor, in one of the poorer districts of London. In the suburbs, people were shocked but had forgotten it, you know, a couple of weeks later, you know, just kind of quickly. But for the poorer communities and the black churches of our city, it was absolutely symptomatic of the deprivation and the neglect of those communities. And it was an absolutely desperate tragedy. And they were not forgetting it. No one's forgotten that. The inquiries are still going on, and those communities are still really angry about that. And if those of us in the suburbs don't share that anger and don't express it with them, it just undermines the division between our communities that we are trying to overcome with the gospel. So at our festival, we stood for two minutes silence, and we showed some of our um, the, the black workers who, who'd, who'd been involved and were tweeting on the radio and speaking of the DJ, a DJ on the radio and so on, just trying to share together the pain and grief that other communities feel. And I think to do that, I mean, sorry, what am I, you guys know about this better than I do, but listening to each other, how can we do things in a way that both our communities and all our communities benefit? So it's listening, isn't it? It's li you know this, sorry. Okay, a couple more and then we're done. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, um, as a young person um, who's just got into, into ministry as an apprentice, uh, my question is, how do you guide yourself against making ministry your idol and remembering that uh, you serve Christ and he is the, the source of joy you should always run to? How should I guard that? Because um, um, it's, a, it's a threat that uh, most people um, idolize ministry and forget why they are in ministry. So how do I, as a young person, guard against that? Um, are you married? Not yet. Um, that would be my first suggestion. <laughs> Sorry, I, I don't mean to be crass, but um, obviously it's perfectly acceptable to choose to be single for the gospel as Paul did. But it is true that once you have the privilege uh, of, of, of marriage, that one of the great things about being married is that you go home and then your primary concern must be your wife and your family. And that takes your mind off ministry and helps you both rest and also to value people in your family more than your ministry or alongside your or part of your ministry. Um, so I think, I think being married does help. Um, I mean, the other, th yeah. I'm not sure. What do you think, Murray? Um, good patterns. I think also just just trusting that it's it's not you who does the work; it's God. Um, so yes, He works through us, and we do have an influence on the end results. But ultimately, it's God, and to know that actually you got to you got to play the long game. So how, you don't want to just be effective for five years; you want to be effective for fifty years. And so get into good, sustainable patterns now. And that'll be different for everyone, but everyone should be having some rest. Um, uh, yeah. And I think in coming back to um, making it the idol, I think if you can understand that your ministry, Murray uses a lovely phrase about growing your fruit on other people's trees. That is, if your ministries can become less and less about you and more and more about enabling other people in their ministries, you'll be celebrating what God is doing in other people's lives and less focused upon what's happening in your own. Um, and I think then you also, you marvel more at what God is doing uh, in the lives of other people. And I think that does help, help you stop focusing upon yourself and your ministry. Because it is true, a lot of us feel we're justified by ministry. I think the other thing about, if I may say, I often, when I'm talking about the swap, the gospel, you know, Christ came down, he was punished for our sin. I'm also explaining to people, Christ came down to complete the perfect Christian life, indeed the perfect Christian life of Christian ministry for us. And he lived the perfect Christian life of ministry for us, uh, completed in his death on the cross. His sacrificial ministry is what qualifies us for heaven. And so he swapped places with us, and he was punished for our sins. So we are acceptable to God in Christ's Christian life, in Christ's Christian life of ministry. It's his perfect pastoral ministry that qualifies us for heaven and not ours. You know, we come to a conference like this, there are a thousand challenges, we're all failures, but Christ was perfect. His, his church ministry uh, is the perfect Christian ministry. And I think if we say that and preach that, we might actually believe it ourselves that I'm saved by his Christian ministry and not by mine. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah.